often mentioned today, and I regret I'm saddened. I'm saddened not only because I'm an ambassador to the United Nations, but because I sincerely believe that it is an exceptional tool that is in crisis uh, currently. And uh, forgive uh, my American friends, uh, the United States is partly responsible for that. The US Congress has just approved uh, 8.3 billion coronavirus response bill while we were here. The entire peacekeeping operations budget of the United Nations is 6.3 billion, even less than 6.3. The United States contribution to the end budget is 22%. The P5 contribution uh, to the peacekeeping budget is higher than the regular contribution, so the United States, according to the latest assessment, has to pay 27.89% The average peacekeeping operation would cost about $1 billion. And you probably have heard many times that Ukraine requested the peacekeeping operation in 2015, and Ambassador Charlie was part of the process of preparing the Parashenko's uh, letter to the Security Council President and the General Assembly President uh, requesting the peacekeeping operation in Ukraine that if in case the peacekeeping operation is deployed in Ukraine would also cost about one billion dollars, of which the United States, based on the assessment of contribution to the PPO budget, would pay 27.89%. That would be probably an additional expense on the US shoulders uh, when it comes to resolving the situation in Ukraine. Therefore, uh, I use this example as uh, <coughs> Another reason why the U.S. taxpayers should be intrinsically interested in having peace achieved in Ukraine as soon as possible, because the U.S., even being in crisis, even being at odds with the United Nations, would still need to pay to the peacekeeping budget of the United, of the United Nations. The SMM was mentioned. Uh, I just mentioned that the entire budget of the OEC is 138 million euros. The budget of the SMM, which is a separate budget, is 108 million euros. So that is yet another argument when I defend the OEC and I say we should really appreciate what the OEC does for Ukraine, spending 108 million euros every year on an operation, and the SMM is the only meaningful presence in the field, whether we like it or not, whether we like the deficiencies of the OEC. Another couple of things before I finish, and I, uh, I'm sure many of us will be happy that this event is uh, over, because we need to digest many, many, many things. And I, come back to New York with many ideas that I would like to digest before I make an informed opinion of uh, many things mentioned today. I missed another thing during today's discussion. It's not a criticism. I'm saying that as a matter of fact. I missed the Ukrainian society and Ukrainian citizens in this discussion. The Orange Revolution, the revolution of dignity, were possible because of the Ukrainian the Ukrainian people are the major factor of the security of Ukraine. It is not the weaponry, it's not the arms, although they are important, it is the Ukrainian people. And the Ukrainian people deserve not only a democratic market, area, economy, the Ukrainian people deserve, deserve human rights. Human rights are the immediate victim of any military aggression. And I think we have to discuss the situation with the human rights in Ukraine in the context of the Russian aggression against Ukraine. Human rights in Ukraine where Ukraine is occupied by King Crimea. Human rights in the territories of the East that are 
and are controlled by the central government. Ukraine and Colombia, for your information, are the only countries that voluntarily, without any request coming from Washington, Berlin, or Paris, invited a UN human rights mission <coughs> to deal specifically with the human rights violations in the context of the military conflict. Therefore, I hope that next time we meet, and I'm sure we meet again, mm -hmm. we will pay more attention to the Ukrainians, Ukraine, regular Ukrainian people, regular Ukrainian women, IDPs, children, who are the most victimized by the conflict. And the very final observation is, on the 18th of uh, February, They shoot, as we say, in their own foot. Because not a single member of the Security Council supported the Russian Federation. All 14 members took the floor, <coughs> one of them supported the Russian Federation. Why I'm saying that? Because I think that this event is not the only event where none of the participants should be converted in our faith. We're all on the same side. There are different shades, but we are all on the same side. Mm -hmm. What I would like to have in our events, I would like to have the Russian ambassador, his deputy, listening to us <laughs> and be tortured. <laughs> <laughs> real. We've had a couple. You know, so we have to go out, we have to reach beyond our very comfortable, friendly uh, meetings, and we have to torture the Russians. We <laughs> have to invite the French, we have to invite yes. the Germans, we yes. have to invite yes. everyone who is trying to make the Russian face look very good, either in New York, or in Geneva, or in Vienna, or wherever else. Yeah. Of course, we need to, to have meetings of the kind and, and have frank discussions among the friends, but I would very much appreciate if we have a Russian guy here, or a Russian woman here, and that they would go bitten out of this room. <laughs> and, and I think, Bravo. Bravo. Thank you, Ambassador. It's, it's an honor for me to be sharing the dais with our esteemed colleague, the permanent representative of Ukraine to the United Nations. I'm sure you're all tired. I'm sure uh, you uh, are happy that I'm the last speaker here, so I will be, uh, definitely be brief. After this long day of presentations and debate, it falls to us to place the 11th U.S. security dialogue in a broader context, and in doing so, hopefully inspire you to action, knowing what you've learned today. Yesterday, Ukraine experienced as big a change in its government than after some election cycles. Two days ago, more than a third of delegates for the Democratic National Convention were assigned. With 14 state primaries and one caucus, electing ne uh, nearly a fifth of all primary voters this election cycle in a single day. Mm -hmm. And just 72 hours ago, I was still in Kiev doing my best to understand both of these events I just mentioned. <laughs> as to the re recent events in Ukraine, I should point out that as president of the Ukrainian Congress of Amer America, the UCCA has made it very clear since our first communications and meetings with President Zelensky that the Ukrainian American community is willing to work with him and the Ukrainian government on our common goals. In regards to U.S. foreign policy, we will always continue to advocate for maintaining a strong Ukrainian army capable of deterring foreign aggression, maintaining the territorial integrity of Ukraine, including the return of territories occupied by Russian forces, charting a course for further integration into the Euro Atlantic structures, including NATO and the European Union. Furthermore, we support continuing the fight against corruption, the adoption of the Ukrainian language as the official state language of Ukraine, and the final separation of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine from the Church of the Aggressor. 
But none of these reforms could come to fruition without first restoring the territorial integrity of Ukraine. On March 1st, just a couple days ago, Russian armed forces violated a ceasefire in a joint forces operation area in eastern Ukraine 11 times. On February 18th, the enemy violated the ceasefire 22 times. In particular, the enemy launched 16 artillery shells and 18 mortar shells on just that one day in the Luhansk region alone, an area which has seen an increased amount of ceasefire violations since the beginning of the year. To that end, Ukraine must maintain a clear and unequivocal position that no elections can take place in the Russian-occupied regions of the Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts until all Russian troops, mercenaries, weapons, and material are withdrawn from Ukrainian territory. Under international law, Ukraine must have the complete control of the Ukrainian side of the Ukraine-Russia border, and the displaced residents of Donbass have the right to peacefully return to their home. To achieve this goal, the UCCA will continue our efforts with the administration in the White House and then focus on expanding Ukraine's bipartisan support in Congress. I think most of you will agree we will and must prioritize NATO's Enhanced Opportunities Program for Ukraine, the renewed possibility of major non-allied MNNA status for Ukraine, and engagement in the United States political process this year. The UCCA has drafted white papers to be submitted to both platform committees, the Republican and Nash and Democrat committees, and we will once again be issuing candidate questionnaires, making sure that the strong Ukrainian presence support are reflected not only by the platforms of both parties, but also by the candidates themselves. Many of you here have participated in our Ukrainian Days of Advocacy, events which encourage busloads of Ukrainians to converge in Washington, D.C. annually to personally ask congressional representatives to support Ukraine through legislative initiatives. For the politically minded, this year's presidential and congressional elections will see candidates across the country looking to talk to you and your communities. I urge you not to shy away from meeting those candidates, but to volunteer and take part in the democratic process, to act boldly and share your Ukrainian-American story with them. Today, Ukraine stands at the front lines in defense of democracy as the risk to the greater democratic world cannot be, cannot be any higher from the ongoing aggression by the Russian Federation and its proxies against Ukraine's territorial integrity. As we gather here today, I am reminded of UCCA's founding memorandum, and it still rings true today, as Ukraine continues its age-old struggle to secure its sovereignty and maintain its territorial integrity. We must remain steadfast in our support for Ukraine and continue to be guided by the mission of the founders of our organization to inform the world of truth about Ukraine, to maintain and support our unique Ukrainian heritage, and to represent the interests of the Ukrainian American community, and also very important, to so honorably serve our new homeland, the United States of America. I want to thank Walter, I want to thank the entire team, I want to thank, thank also the additional sponsors for hosting today's event. It's an important event to take place. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just, uh, I, uh, I've seen a lot of our, our conferences, and I must say this one, a nine to five, it actually has ended on time. Um, additionally, the audience was a very good audience, and we had a standing room only audience. And I must say that on, on the panels, I've always bragged that the panels were all you know, the top quality. I think the exhaustion that the ambassador has talked about comes from the fact that you've heard the very best experts in Washington on the issue. I, 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 from beginning to end, I mean, from the very first word to the very last words, I must say, this was probably the most, and I, we've done over 100 of these, this is probably the most intensive thing I've seen uh, in a long time, if ever. So I want to thank all of you for having come. I'm, I'm going to be asking some of you, and Ambassador, you might be proud of us, we will be asking that broader question because we're going to be doing our annual report card in six different categories, not just security, but economy, national identity, social cohesion, do admit to you now, and this is where I am, that the multilateral item that you just mentioned, especially with you now at the United Nations, the multilateral item, we've been talking about bilateral, regional, and so on and so forth, multilateral, the UN, that we really have to go back to that book on Ukraine, that panel on Ukraine. So with that, 
With that, I must say thank you very much for everybody. I'm asking everybody, there is a wonderful reception over at the American Foreign Policy Council. You'll see a whole bunch of wonderful pictures <laughs> of the old Cold War and, uh, and Bunsby, what we call the new Cold War. Uh, no, just kidding. Uh, the American Foreign Policy Council people are inviting you to a nice reception of somewhere between 6 and 8. Um, and the address is um, 509 C Street, uh, Northeast. Uh, I invite all of you, okay? Uh, I think it'll be fun. Thank you very much. Again, the Zeus